Hello to all my Lakomi homies. Welcome to your lesson on the Silk Road. So many of you already learned about the Silk Road back in junior high, uh, but we're going to look at it again, and this time look at it more through the lens of globalization. Okay, before we get into the Silk Road, let's go over a couple of terms that you should probably know about. So, question, how do the things you buy get to you? Well, we have different means of transportation in today's globalizing world, right? So we have cargo ships that transport goods in shipping containers. We have airplanes, we have railroads with trains on them, and we have lots and lots of semi-trucks that carry things as well, transport trucks. All right, so those are the ways in which things get to us, and this allows for what we call international trade. Okay, so international trade, the word inter means between, and uh, so between nations, trade between nations is international trade. We also call it world trade. Sometimes we call it global trade as well. And uh, that's part of what we're talking about today with the Silk Road, right? So it's the exchange of materials, goods, and services among distant groups of people, right? In fact, that's most of what we're talking about today with the Silk Road. So that is international trade. And we're going to take a look at international trade in the three rounds of globalization. So, of course, we are here in the third round of globalization. And so, as you know, international trade is uh, global today, right? Most of the things that we buy come from very, very far away. And uh, they arrive here using different means of transportation that we discussed in the last couple of photos. Uh, we're going to go all the way back to the first round of globalization in this lesson. Okay, we're gonna take a look at uh, different, well, we're really, re we're really just gonna look at one ancient trade route, uh, and that is the Silk Road, okay? There were, of course, of course, many uh, networks of trade routes that existed uh, in the first round of globalization in all parts of the world. Uh, but the Silk Road is a very impressive one. It's a really big one that really stands out. And so that's the reason why we talk about the Silk Road, there it is again. All right, so the Silk Road, you can see in your notes, there is a sentence starter that needs to be completed. Well, the Silk Road was the, oh, oh, I forgot that I had some little animations. And there we go. The Silk Road was a network of ancient trading routes that connected Asian peoples to European and North African peoples. Okay, so uh, if you look at these pictures, these give you an idea of the way in which goods were transported in the old Silk Road, right? So there were lots of camels. Camels are, of course, uh, great animals for traveling through desolate areas with, um, you know, not very many lakes and rivers and, you know, places to drink water because camels can go a long time without drinking water. And then when they come across some water, they drink a lot of it. All right, so camels are great, but they don't smell great. So here is the Silk Road at the height or at its peak um, of its existence. So it was really big, as you can see, right? So we can see that different cities and different towns um, throughout Asia became connected to each other through trade. Uh, and uh, it was possible and it was, you know, it was desirable for people to trade with each other in Asia because of latitudes, right? You guys learned this in the last couple of lessons. The difference between latitudes and longitudes is a big deal, right? So if you live over here in, let's say, what is now China, and you grow some plants, and you have some animals over here that have allowed for a civilization to prosper, well, it's possible for you to sell those same plants and animals to people who live over here, maybe. Because even though the terrain is not the same, um, both of these places are along roughly the same latitude, which means the time of day is about the same and the climate is similar, right? And so the plants and animals that are going to grow well over here are also going to grow reasonably well over here. So it's actually worthwhile to trade with each other. 
And so people from way over here in China would be trading with people way over here in Europe because the differences between these two places were relatively small and it was actually worthwhile trading with each other. All right, the same type of trade network was just not possible in the Americas, right? Because look at the Americas. The Americas are very uh, long in terms of longitude, right? So uh, the latitude here versus the latitude here is completely different. And so we have very, very different climates as we travel through the Americas, right? Um, much of this region here is very tropical, right? And so extremely different plants and animals are capable of existing here um, than let's say up here near Calgary. So there's, there was never any reason for people in uh, you know, the, the prairies of North America to ever want to do any trading with people in the tropics because the plants and animals that they would trade with each other would not survive in each other's climates, right? And so that's the reason why we end up with a massive trading network in uh, Afro-Eurasia, whereas we don't end up with a massive trading network in the Americas. Now that is not to say that there were no trading networks in the Americas, because that would be very wrong if I said that. There were of course many trading networks, many trading routes, people exchanged with each other. There were big empires in the Americas before the arrival of people from, the, uh, from Eurasia. Um, however, they weren't as big, right? That, that's, that's about it. They just, none of them got to the same size as the Silk Road and none of them allowed for the same exchange of goods and ideas as the Silk Road did, okay? Silk Road was huge, right? Um, it consisted of about 12,000 kilometers of trails. There were many, many trails. It was not just one road, right? Uh, it was a network of roads and there were a lot of trading posts along the way and nobody really traveled the whole trail, right? It's not like one person over here in Japan, in Kyoto, would be like, hey, I really want to buy some spices. So they're going to like walk or ride a camel all the way down into India. No, of course, that did not happen, right? Instead, a person from this city in India would sell something to somebody in this city of India, and that person in this city would sell to somebody over here who would sell to somebody over here, and somebody over here and here and here, and eventually would make its way to Kyoto in Japan. Um, but it would need to pass through you know, hundreds of people uh, who each of those people would only travel a small distance in that network of trading routes. Cool. Uh, look at that. Worms, all right? We got worms on the screen. Uh, this, these are silk worms, all right? So where were they? The worms, they, uh, they are born when an egg hatches and they become a worm, which is a larva. They wrap themselves in a silk cocoon, right? So they wrap themselves in threads, silk threads, and then the cocoon um, eventually allows a uh, caterpillar or a moth, or yeah, caterpillar, a moth to come out, right? So the moth comes out and then the moth lays eggs. That is the life cycle of the silkworm, right? And so the part that we're interested in here is the cocoon. Right, so when the moth leaves, it leaves behind this cocoon. And so here are the cocoons, and the cocoons are made of silk thread, right? And so it's possible to uh, soften that silk thread and to uh, weave the silk thread and to create a really awesome fabric called silk that people really enjoy and people love. And uh, that is the reason why the silk road was created in the first place. It started in good old China, right? During the Han Empire, which um, was a long time ago, you know, sometime between 200 BC and 200 AD uh, is probably when the Silk Road uh, was first constructed. It started off small, of course, in the Han Empire, in what is now China. Um, however, it grew, of course, it grew, it grew, and it grew, and it especially grew uh, when much of the Mediterranean world over here was united under the Roman Empire, right? So we had the Roman Empire over here. We had uh, the Silk Road, which was growing, you know, making its way out of China into Central Asia. And eventually, eventually the two made contact with each other. 
and uh, allowed for an exchange of lots of things, goods and ideas, unfortunately also disease, which you learned about in junior high, right? But eventually the Silk Road became massive. All right, so what kinds of things were produced in the West? Well, pearls were produced in the Western part of the Silk Road. By the way, which part would be the West? Mm, think about it. It would be this part over here. The West is on the left side of the map. Okay, so pearls, jade, herbal medicines, perfume, grapes, glass. Okay, this is just a small list of things that were produced in the West. They were created in the West and they were made by people over here. And so people in the East wanted to buy those things. And so they did through the Silk Road. And then, of course, there were very interesting things that were produced in the East, like silk, obviously, <laughs> because we call it the Silk Road. Um, what else? Precious gems came from the East, animals and plants, spices, right? So think about India. India has been a place of uh, many, many spices for a long time, and that's always been an important part of India's whole thing. Uh, gunpowder. How about that? Eh? Gunpowder came from Asia. Um, so you guys learned about guns, germs, and steel, and how Europeans, when they arrived in the Americas, they had guns with them. Well, that technology originated in, uh, in the East. It originated in East Asia. And so the Silk Road gave a big advantage to people who lived in uh, Europe and Asia and North Africa because they could take good ideas from each other, right? They could, they could take inventions and innovations from each other and build upon them, whereas people in the Americas did not have the same amount of ability to do that, okay? And did we say paper? I don't think we said paper. Yeah, so paper as well, which is obviously extremely important um, with exchanging ideas, okay? Here we go, ideas. Ideas were shared too. Uh, innovations, inventions. Um, so. Uh, what kinds of things? Well, writing, right? The invention of, uh, of of writing, so people could write books, people could write stories, and write letters to each other. That's an extremely important way to build on the knowledge of other people, and that is one extremely important way in which societies advance is by writing down their ideas and their knowledge. Um, religions consist of ideas. One religion that spread through the Silk Road was Buddhism, right, which originated in India, but then really took hold in East Asia. Music, right, so string, wind, and percussion instruments from both East and West influenced each other. Um, so this is an instrument which is actually from Persia, which we now call Iran. And uh, you can see how it's similar to, you know, the European oboe, the clarinet. Uh, and uh, so instruments from, you know, one part of the Silk Road would influence other people to create similar instruments. The Silk Road did not last forever. <clears throat> Trade by land became more and more dangerous, and people started... And people started to trade a lot more by, um, through the seas, right? Through the seas on boats, right? And so that is... Uh, one way in which the Silk Road declines. Okay, so let's leave it at that. That's all. Have a good day. See ya.